Hi everyone. Uh, it's really nice to to be here. Uh, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, hopefully, I will uh, meet you all. Uh, I'll hear from you all after the presentation uh, because it would be nice to know about uh, each of you. Uh, at least, you know, your personal backgrounds and your interests in, in the topic. Uh, but I will um, hopefully, uh, about my presentation will take about half an hour uh, and then uh, I will open it up for uh, Q&A. So um, I'm currently in uh, UC Dublin in Ireland. Uh, I'm in the uh, final year of my PhD. Uh, I have actually, I've, I've paused the PhD for six months uh, because I'm uh, doing an internship with uh, DeepMind at the moment. Uh, but hopefully at the end of the internship, the idea is to go back and write my PhD thesis and hopefully um, and, and, and with it. So my research is um, in cognitive science. Um, within cognitive science, uh, my background is uh, in a very specific school of thought called embodied, embodied cognitive science uh, and, uh, and inactive cognitive science. So I know you are all cognitive scientists, but I wouldn't be surprised if you are not familiar with embodied cognitive science. It's kind of a niche area uh, that um, that started out 20, 30 years ago, but it, but now it's gaining a lot of momentum, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, kind of spreading uh, or getting a lot of attention. So so today I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, so up today I'm going to give you a little. I'm going to come. I'm going to approach that the question of uh, cognition, uh, the idea of what a person is from that specific school of thought, from embodied cognitive science, and I will weave it with uh, current machine learning systems, uh, and we will get to uh, the ethics of it all, uh, because after all, uh, this is a lecture on the ethics of cognitive science. So we will look at what embodied cognitive science uh, theories say about what cognition is, what people are, what social systems are, uh, and we will look at what machine learning systems are doing, uh, and then uh, we will move on to uh, the ethical questions. So, as I said, um, embodied cognitive science is relatively new uh, over the last 20, 30 years ago, uh, and at the core of it is really kind of pushing back against you know the canonical or the traditional understanding of cognition in the in understanding of people so uh, traditionally uh, we would look at for example we would study the brain to understand say what cognition is uh, and the underlying assumption would be that uh, you know, you can uh, take the person as a unit of study. Study that studying that person will give you a somewhat uh, clear idea of their cognitive states. Whereas embodied cognitive science is like, you know, forget all that. That's all too simplistic. You cannot get a clear idea of what a person is by studying a single person or by looking at the brain, because. Uh, cognition doesn't end at the skull and the person doesn't end at the skin. So famous thesis, for example, the extended mind thesis that came out in 1998 by Andy Clark and David Chalmers. Maybe you covered this when you were uh, covering the question of consciousness. consciousness. Uh, so you have uh, canonical papers, landmark papers like that saying like, no, cognition does not end at the skull, but rather it extends. So, for example, they give the iPhone as an extension of your mind uh, because you use it to simplify uh, various cognitive tasks for you. Uh, another aspect that the embodied school of thought pushes is that uh, it's not just the person that gives you by just not you just don't understand the person by just studying the person. 
but rather in order to gain a full understanding, you need to look at the person as embedded in a web of relations. You need to look at the whole relations, the whole web, web the whole environment, uh, the context that the person is coming from, in the historical background, uh, and all those interactions. So the idea is to include all those aspects, all the, you know, the context, the dynamic, the relation, uh, and the, the history, the culture, as part of what makes a person a person, as part of what constitutes cognition. So this embodied cognitive uh, school of thought really kind of uh, muddies the water, so to say, about what cognition is by kind of uh, by kind of showing like it's never neat the person is never an island uh, but you know the person is never fully definable and, and understandable uh, but rather uh, you know always moving uh, continually changing and at the car at the heart of it the person is unpredictable so these are um, some passages from recent books. Uh, this is from uh, Linguistic Poetry. Uh, it's, it's become one of the recent books uh, that has re redefined the uh, area of uh, embodied cognitive science. Uh, I will read the quote from there. So living bodies are not stationary entities that can be captured in neat taxonomies, we cannot uh, understand the person once and for all, and we cannot define cognition once and for all, uh, but rather people are active, dynamic, historical, social, cultural, gendered, politicized, and contextualized. So we need to take all these contexts uh, in, in consideration when we are attempting to understand what a person is, what cognition is, and what social systems are. Uh, embodied cognitive science also borrows uh, fundamental uh, thinking from uh, complex system science. Uh, there is so much overlap. So uh, yeah, the school, the embodied cognitive takes a, uh, a lot from from uh, the underlying pr principles of complex systems thinking. Uh, so what we take. What's core from there is that uh, human beings, just like any uh, complex adaptive uh, phenomena, uh, is uh, you know are necessarily or simply unpredictable for all the factors I I, I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. So if you want to model uh, a complex system. Uh, you will have to, your model has to be uh, as complex as the thing that you are trying to model itself. Because uh, any attempt to uh, model a, a complex system will leave some elements out because, uh, because the system that you are trying to model in, in henceforth trying to create might take a different direction or a different dynamic to the actual model. So the point is that uh, because complex adaptive systems, which humans are part of, humans are also taken as complex adaptive system, uh, it, it's impossible to model them in a, capture them in a precise way. Um, the same point, again, uh, from uh, embodied cognitive scientists, they emphasize that uh, people, our way of knowing, uh, our knowledge of the world, uh, and people themselves are uh, full of uncertainty, uh, inconsistent, uh, and, and ambiguous, and sometimes contradictory. Uh, people are not really rational beings that move in a calculated way, but rather almost at, in, in, in an ad hoc manner. Uh, that makes it really difficult to put, pin them down and, uh, you know, uh, model their behavior in a predictable way. Uh, so a little bit of caveat, uh, all this emphasis on unpredictability doesn't mean that uh, human beings or complex, complex adaptive systems are completely aimless. 
they just wander in any direction that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there is patterns to how people behave and act how people go on uh, you know doing their own lives uh, but a lot of the patterns and, and uh, habits uh, amount to uh, norms, cultural norms, and, and, and social conventions uh, that accumulate over time. And these social norms and um, you know, accumulations of habits and somewhat relatively stable behaviors are necessarily mixed with uh, you know, social norms and uh, what become taken, uh, what becomes seen as, uh, you know, a socially acceptable behavior uh, and, and uh, uh, in a way, uh, stereotyping of uh, people. So uh, when we then cluster or when we try to find patterns of similarities, uh, there is a very good chance that we are clustering stereotypes as opposed to getting at the fundamental, you know, actual real patterns of people's behaviors. And uh, moving on to the uh, machine learning aspect, uh, as we've seen, uh, embodied cognitive science and systems thinking uh, at the core of it really emphasizes how people and complex adaptive systems are, you know, dynamic, changing, fluctuating, unpredictable. Uh, but on the other hand, we have machine learning systems that are doing the opposite of uh, what stands out as a fundamental stance. So machine learning systems, especially that the ones that are applied in, in, in hiring, in education, even when we are even in um, uh, uh, in, in, in social various social networks such as for uh, Facebook uh, in uh, deployed for targeted advertising uh, those algorithms those machine learning systems necessarily are trying to cluster patterns of behaviors uh, and they are trying to make predictions. So what machine learning does stands at the opposite end of uh, what complex adaptive systems and embodied cognitive science tells us is uh, genuine human behavior. Uh, however, when machine learning systems classify and cluster patterns, uh, they really are not uh, getting at a, re a really fundamental causal relation between the behavior and the true nature of things. Uh, but rather, a lot of those systems are really picking up so societally held beliefs, values, and stereotypes. Um, and the more uh, the phenomena that is being classified and, and sorted and predicted steers towards the social, uh, the more it's a social behavior, uh, the more machine learning systems are, the more machine learning systems completely fail to accurately or reliably classify because social systems, as we've seen, are inherently unpredictable and there are infinite ways that they could, they could proceed, that they could move on. So machine learning, machine, machine classification and prediction of social behavior becomes useless, sometimes harmful. Uh, to, to kind of uh, illustrate this, um, Arvid Narayanan, uh, I think a Princeton uh, professor has uh, classified AI systems into three broad categories. So the first one is uh, perception. Uh, it could be object recognition, and um, this is a straightforward task. Uh, we can, uh, you know, we can train machine learning systems to recognize whether there is an object, whether you know, object or no object, uh, because there is not so much ambiguity, uh, there is not so much, uh, you know, complexity to the task. 
So those things uh, machine learning systems are good at doing, but also uh, those tasks are not that complex and difficult. Automating judgment, that sits somewhere in between, but predicting social outcomes such as you know, who is going to behave this way, who is going to be a criminal, uh, who who should be getting, uh, you know, uh, who should be, who in hiring, for example, uh, using algorithmic systems to, to predict uh, a good employee is becoming uh, very common. Uh, so tasks such as like predicting a good employee, for example, falls in the social category. So for tasks like that, machine learning systems are not only useless because they completely fail to accurately predict, but they are also harmful because they are picking up stereotypes and what is they are picking up uh, what is what is uh, traditionally or socially uh, seen as a good employee uh, by society. Uh, and uh, so this is a recent work where. Uh, Salganik et al. Uh, tried to um, tried to predict this, the trajectories of uh, children from coming from vulnerable vulnerable families. So they had a team of 160 machine learning researchers, each team building a predictive model. Uh, they had a, a huge data set, and what they found is that not even one team can create a model that is close to benchmark uh, or it, the, the base model was slightly better than uh, the, the simple benchmark. So this, um, this, is, this evidence, uh, this empirical evidence shows you that uh, predicting social outcomes really is impossible, uh, but it can also be harmful. And, and as I said earlier, uh, when we are creating uh, machine learning systems here and deploying them into the world. For example, Amazon used a hiring algorithm uh, to sort uh, people that will be best employees, uh, and they discovered that it was uh, uh, it was sifting out or it was leaving uh, women's CVs, and they stopped using that algorithm. Uh, Again, another famous case uh, where machine learning systems are used uh, in uh, policing uh, to predict who is going to, uh, you know, commit crime. And what they found is the algorithms again perpetuate social stereotypes, and this was stopped. Um, Self-driving cars. I mean, the uh, the object detection systems, the object recognition systems within self-driving cars, uh, in a recent study, found that those systems were able to, to uh, detect uh, people uh, with uh, lighter skin tones at a higher rate compared to darker skin tones. So uh, the object recognition systems in those self-driving cars can recognize white people better uh, and while failing to recognize uh, black people. And uh, another example uh, where machine learning systems are used in, uh, in healthcare uh, to assess uh, who is um, uh, who should be getting uh, medical care, and they found that the algorithm failed, uh, was negatively impacting uh, uh, black people, uh, and and there are so many examples, and it goes on and on and on, and through all these uh, examples, what you find is that uh, people that are at the margins of society are the most impacted when algorithmic systems go wrong. Again, if you can see here in uh, uh, in applying machine learning systems to health, you see that black people are negatively impacted uh, in uh, targeted advertising for jobs, women are impacted, uh, trans people in gender recognition systems fail to recognize uh, black pe trans people, uh, and again, targeted advertising uh, for jobs excludes older workers and immigrants, people of color, women, children. So the 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 recurring theme is the same. Uh, the more you are marginalized, the more you are negatively impacted. And uh, 
these predictions are uh, part of um, th these predictions are not problematic in and of themselves because uh, because they are inaccurate but also uh, by predicting because we act on it because it's performative because we deploy those algorithms into society prediction itself uh, is part of uh, uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy prediction contributes to what becomes uh, what we see in the world so uh, the traffic predictions influence traffic patterns uh, crime location prediction influences police allocation uh, recommendation systems shape people's preference um, here's another recent study but by Milano uh, et al 2020 uh, what they found is that predictive systems uh, re recommender systems uh, influence people's choice they shape people's choice so not only do they shape our sense of agency uh, our state of cognition but also these systems uh, impact uh, Im impact society at large another example this uh, this came from uh, the wall street journal where facebook itself admitted that 60% of all extremist groups uh, that join Facebook come because of Facebook's recommendation system itself. So recommendation systems uh, end up impacting, uh, you know, whether people join uh, uh, extremist groups or not. And uh, Ruha Benjamin, uh, this is a brilliant book. I recommend you read it if you haven't already. Uh, has said that crime prediction algorithms should more accurately be called crime production algorithms because again prediction influences production uh, so it might we might say that you know technology is impacting us all and predictive systems affect everybody uh, but the point is that uh, there is a power asymmetry. Uh, there is a, a uh, there is a hierarchy, a societal hierarchy where uh, people that are uh, creating these systems uh, have the power, are creating take for all, uh, are and, and are impacted much less with this technology compared to uh, people uh, that are being subjected uh, to uh, these systems. So to recap, when we are creating predictive models, those predictive models are inherently conservative because uh, making prediction usually heavily leans uh, on, uh, on past, past data or historical data. We make prediction about the future based on what the past looks like in the past. Uh, is uh, full of um, injustices. Uh, people at the margins of society are often tr treated uh, cruelly. Uh, and uh, as we take the past as the ground truths uh, to make predictions about the future, we are recreating the past and perpetuating those uh, injustices. And um, yeah, so again, to recap, if we go back to the first few slides, we see that uh, people in, in, in uh, complex adaptive systems in general are uh, non-predictable, indeterminable. They exist in a web of relations. They are continually changing, fluctuating, and they, they, they have infinite potentials to be in infinite directions to, to proceed from. Uh, but on the other hand, we look at uh, most of machine learning, uh, which is trying to kind of narrow down possibilities and classify and, and predict and impose a determinability. Uh, we've also seen that uh, society operates in a power uh, asymmetric manner where, uh, you know, the social structure gives opportunity uh, and and uh, and uh, options or chances uh, based on you know gender, race, uh, you know ethnicity, and so on. Uh, whereas the same social structure could also be 
an obstacle uh, if you are not a certain race, gender, or ethnicity. Um, so, uh, so we, we, we have a problem. Uh, and the, the ethical uh, implications uh, of that is that um, a, a lot of technology that is being into, deployed into the social world uh, impacts, uh, negatively impacts uh, uh, vulnerable people, people that are uh, being marginalized in a, in a disproportionate way. So what should, what does ethic that considers that look like? So uh, the proposition uh, in, in some of my papers, at least uh, that I put forward is that uh, if we want to make, take ethical, uh, we have to, uh, instead of trying to cluster, classify and predict, we, uh, we should try to make uh, machine learning models in, or any other models that try to understand you know people in their context in their history cities uh, you know in their in their own environment as opposed to just uh, make, trying to make predictions based on past data and another option is uh, since uh, marginalized people are disproportionately impacted disproportionately uh, when we want to make take ethical we have to think from their perspective we have to put their welfare and their interest at the center and then work from there. Uh, sometimes no technology is better. Sometimes no technology at all is the ethical thing to do. And um, as we've seen again, uh, technology maintains you know, the past and, and keeps power where it already exists. So one option uh, is to think about technology that can shift power from the least power, from the most powerful to the least powerful. Uh, and as we've seen previously, uh, we've also seen that people are, uh, you know, unpredictable uh, and indeterminable. And instead of uh, aspiring for uh, technological systems that try to kind of classify and predict people, maybe we can come up with technology that embraces this indeterminability, uh, this messiness, and this ambiguity uh, that that is inherent to human nature. Uh, yeah, in, in um, I think these are points I, I covered. And uh, no take applies to, uh, if you if we go back and, and look at uh, Narayanan's uh, three broad classification, uh, you know perception, uh, automation, and predict uh, automation of judgment and predicting social outcomes, uh, a lot of the systems that we create and deploy to predict social outcomes are in the red zone because they are inaccurate and useless, but also they are harmful. So uh, for a lot of that take that falls in in that uh, in this. Uh, Third category, we are better off with no take at all. And uh, yeah, that is uh, that is the the end of um, my presentation. So I'm open for discussion, for questions, for comments. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ababa. Uh, that was really precise and interesting lecture. Um, now let's move to our students' question share session, I guess. Some students may have questions. So, okay, uh, Manuel, you can proceed. Uh, okay, thank you so much for the um, concise presentation. So my question is, um, so you and um, Dr. Timnit and um, others were uh, really outspoken on this topic and um, that was a, a really nice contribution. Um, so mainly this kind of, especially when we talk about machine learning, uh, you train it and the bias is shown on the end application. And when you trace it, you trace it back to the data and the distribution. Um, there was a famous argument between Timnit and uh, Jan Lekon on whether the data or the algorithm is the problem. So what do you think? Do you think there is intrinsic problem in the algorithm themselves 
or is it limited to the data itself? And the other question is, um, you know, representation matters uh, for the most part. And uh, when you take, especially say, African people, black people, we are kind, we are poor people for the most part, and our representation is limited on our economic uh, participation in the world economy. And um, don't you think that, I mean, uh, let me phrase it this way. Do you think that uh, this problem will be solved without Africa being a um, richer country, a richer continent like the others? Ah, oh, excellent questions, but very big, big, big questions. We could have hours talking about, uh, especially the second question. The first one uh, is, yeah. So I'll start with the first question, you know, the the debate between uh, Jan Lacun and uh, Dr. Timnit that got a little nasty, uh, so it's uh, it's not nice. But I think the whole point of is it the data, is it the algorithm really is, it misses the point. Uh, as I have like, you know, it's never the algorithm or never the data itself. It's a much broader problem. And uh, I have to also try to, to write about this in, in my latest paper. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's not really biased data. It's, it's a much wider problem. Uh, it, it begins with, first of all, what you take as is the problem. So even by defining the problem, you are bringing your own perception, your own understanding in, in your own conception of what the problem is. And by you know searching for a certain type of research questions, you are leaving out others by using, by trying to curate a certain type of data, you are leaving out other data and, uh, and also, um, yeah, there is a whole, a whole range of uh, problems and bringing the question, boiling it down to either data or algorithm uh, is, is never a problem, is, is never a, a, a good way to proceed. Uh, I guess maybe I'll illustrate this with uh, one of the examples. So, for example, uh, there is a a project that started out as a parody uh, where people are trying to predict white collar crime uh, in in New York. So they are using. Uh, uh, using people's addresses and um, what is it called uh, in the US? Uh, you know, air, they are using area code to kind of say, of all these rich CEOs, XTOs and directors, who is likely to, you know, uh, to, to commit fraud, to commit white collar crime. So that flips the whole idea of, uh, you know, uh, the whole idea of what is a problem. So usually when we think about criminality, people go immediately to like, if, if it's in America, people will go to like black neighborhoods because socially we associate black people with criminality. But if you look at the data, like the kind of crime pe black people commit, such as like, you know, uh, uh, just petty theft and stuff like that constitutes only a tiny proportion of criminality and the biggest form of criminality comes from uh, minimum wage theft so this is big companies cheating on minimum wage workers so not paying minimum wage workers properly so that constitutes the biggest crime but people don't study that people don't study like how are you know, uh, black people being robbed, but because we have a social, we are socially conditioned to think of certain people as criminals. So by studying, by kind of proposing to study white collar crime, people are flipping our understanding of what a criminal is. So, I mean, 
it's this is a social a societal level issue rather than so when you think about that the whole idea of is it the data or the algorithm doesn't really make sense because it's it's much broader it's about thinking about these things from a really broader uh, point of view um, and the second question uh, do you think we should in don't you think we should enrich the African continent uh, before uh, we are represented uh, yeah definitely but I we should also um, think about this really carefully and not put the onus on uh, you know on individual responsibility uh, like we have to account for for history, for the for story, for you know how Africa became what it is, uh, by looking at uh, through through the lens of the past. So, I mean, it's not it's not Africans' fault that we are uh, you know uh, underserved, undernourished. Uh, even though Ethiopia has never been colonized. The whole, we still face the same fate in the whole continent, uh, even after colonialism have left, still there is so much hang up. There is so much of the contingency that has left the continent. I mean, uh, various countries uh, tried to, uh, I, I don't know the exact number of countries, but a handful of countries still pay colonial tax to France, for example. So even though colonialism is left, these countries, uh, I can dig up the, the reference to this number of countries, these countries are still legally obliged to do uh, their uh, national businesses through France, uh, France as a mediator. So they still pay so much tax and the various presidents of those countries tried to get rid of the mediation of France, either disappear or they they face various issues so i mean what i'm trying to say is we cannot we cannot just say to africans just you know strap yourself by your shoe by your bootstrap or whatever and just get rich uh, we have there there is a lot of historical contingency that has left that has led us to to being the way things are so we have to tackle those structural issues we have to tackle the influence of the West and, and we have to address the roots, the problem from the roots. And, and then we can talk about prosperity. Uh, and uh, But also economic prosperity is not the only form of prosperity. Uh, we can, I mean, there are various people that are also trying to change the narratives, the images of Africa, uh, because even though there are, uh, there, you know, historically and currently, there is so much scientific discovery in 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 you know in in medicine, uh, in in various fields, uh, even in arts, uh, in uh, mathematics, in philosophy. Africa has been a central contributor in historical times and currently. But when Africa is brought up into the attention in in the media, we don't hear about those positive contributions. We hear those negative stereotypes. We hear those. Uh, it's associated with, you know, hunger or drought or disease. So we also have to change those narratives. So it's not that we don't have positive things. It's the stereotype prevents Africa from being seen uh, in in uh, what it can contribute. Um, sorry, I'm rambling, but I mean, it's it's a big question you raised, and I hope that addresses uh, some of some of your uh, yeah, your questions. Uh, I think you definitely addressed them. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, for instance, uh, for instance, let's consider the face recognition uh, applications. So one of the reasons they, they have uh, for the biases that we notice in most of the face recognition models is the scarce data from the African side, from the cleared people side, for instance. Do you think just providing such kind of data or enriching such kind of uh, uh, data sets would help uh, to, to overcome these problems? So I'm going to um, 
So excuse me if I come across as uh, okay. self-sailing. Uh, I'm just sharing a recent paper with Reddy uh, Tabbaba and other collaborators. Uh, we looked at those uh, exact issues you raised, not Nile. Uh, so there is, I mean, Yolanda's concern about by sharing data, we get rid of these uh, negative uh, stereotypes is, is not all, you know, it's not unusual. So many, uh, there are so many narratives to that effect. And the idea of, you know, open data movement and data sharing movement, uh, the, the idea is uh, it will bring uh, African researchers in African science, African excellence on a par with uh, European counterparts. That is, mm -hmm. so for many African researchers, when you ask for funding, uh, or even if you are working with NGOs, one of the conditions they make is that you have to make your data open, or you have to share your data with other you know, governments or other bodies because data sharing is seen as a really positive thing so in this paper what we looked at is like is it actually is data sharing is opening up uh, you know research really a good thing for african researchers not for everybody because it is good for european researchers for example there is this tradition called parachute research where when data is open european researchers would often take the advantage of, you know, sourcing openly available data, and they end up the ones that are publishing on prestigious journals, even though the data is about Africa, collected by African researchers, and comes from African communities. So what you find is even open data initiatives end up benefiting global North researchers than African researchers. So we are not, in the paper, we are not commenting that open data or data sharing is a bad idea. It's not, we support it, but we want to emphasize that even when we have movements, movements such as open data and data sharing, we have to acknowledge the structural barriers. You know, African researchers don't have as much, as much infrastructure. They don't have easy access to data portals. And there are so many other obstacles that get in the way. So when people are raving about open data, people also have to consider and be mindful how that open data can also benefit Africans where the data is about them, but also they are the ones that are you know, collecting and organizing data. So the point we are trying to make is we have to ask who is benefiting and we have to make sure that you know the data subjects and the people where data is sourced from also are the people that are benefiting from open data. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay. Any uh, more questions? Any, okay, that's why that's famous too. You can ask. Hear you. Yes, yes. Uh, can, can you can, can you hear me now? Uh, kind of. Okay. Let's go. Someone. Oh, oh. Someone. Yes, someone. Now. Okay. So uh, my 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 question is that uh, uh, the way the way uh, observation how you presented to us uh, uh, the concerns of bears is very awesome. Uh, but my 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 remark here is that uh, uh, as Africans, as Ethiopians, what is the best way to cope with uh, innovations from West? Because we can't tell them uh, not to innovate that uh, because it it hurts us or it it is the discriminating us in a certain way. So no one is going to stop uh, innovating to to avoid the bias so uh, and even most of the westerns 
they don't think that it's our our uh, the the fact that Africa is a colony is not their fault. It's it's Africa's fault that uh, Africa uh, is not uh, enabled itself, and uh, Africa did not utilize its own indigenous resources. So, for all the mistakes, uh, Africa uh, just kept on blaming even recently because now we, we are not able to cope up so uh, we are just uh, telling them just this is hurting us this is hurting us and when it comes to uh, this this is specific uh, machine learning and AI topics uh, <coughs> the, it, I think all those biases are originated from the lack of sufficient data uh, because for example, when uh, when uh, someone uses a, 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 a data to classify whether one is a thief or not, uh, he use he 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 bases that classification based on the previous input data. Maybe ninety per ninety five percent or ninety nine percent of the thieves were clearly uh, in some category uh, in gender wise in some category and five three percent are just from certain category so uh, even human as a human we judge like if we see uh, uh, someone maybe uh, closed with a robe like Arab guy uh, dropping uh, a bag we may think something is gonna explode just the way we judge it. Uh, and maybe the, the 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 fact that algorithms are judging the same way I think it it, it makes sense to me so uh, how how do you how do you see this view like uh, can we tell the West to just criticize and uh, tell them stop innovating because it's discriminating us or uh, we should uh, cope by innovating and enabling ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Tasfai. That's a great question. And uh, we have a few minutes, so I will try to answer that within within the next three minutes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, innovation, if it comes at the price of, you know, uh, dehumanizing people, if it comes at the price of uh, creating a society that is really hurting a certain people, then I wouldn't call that innovation. I would rather no innovation than innovation that is bad for certain people. Uh, so I would redefine what innovation is. Innovation has to eventually contribute to the well-being of people, to creating a better society, to being a better human in general. We cannot be better humans if we are hurting and discriminating uh, and dehumanizing certain people and, and treating certain people as subhumans. Then that in, I would redefine innovation. If innovation allows you to dehumanize and hurt certain people, then I would not classify it as innovation. Uh, second of all, you mentioned about say an Arab guy dropping something we would assume uh, you know a terrorist so i would ask we hold our stereotypical beliefs and look at the data because if you look at the data for example in the us the biggest terrorist group is white men because if you classify terrorism as killing people because of religious different religious beliefs you will find that there are there are shootings of, you know, uh, Asian people. There are shootings of black women because they are of different race. And there are shootings of Muslims or committed by right-wing conservative people. And they commit way more terrorist crime than we typically, than, you know, Arab, Arab uh, communities. But because there is a really ingrained stereotype of people associating terrorism with Arabs, 
we immediately think of Arabs, of course. So what I would ask is we, we rethink what we mean by terrorism and look at the data and, and also redefine our idea of what a terrorism is, just like we redefined, just like the people creating uh, algorithms to catch white collar crime by looking at uh, New York um, CEOs and CTOs and directors, uh, just like the way they re redefined what crime is, I would ask us we redefine what terrorism is or or any anything else for that matter. Then we will look at the world uh, in in a in a different way. And uh, do we stop? Do you tell the ways to stop? No, we don't. I mean, uh, if if it's if it's invasion that comes at the high cost, yes, they should stop. But also. Uh, we should not lean uh, on the West to to invent for us. So there are so many grassroots uh, initiatives and inventions. I'm connected with people in Addis, in Ghana, uh, in uh, Bamako, where uh, people are, you know, starting like a biomedical lab, uh, you know, a robotics lab. Where trying, where they are trying to create African inventions, African technology driven by Africans that is benefiting Africans themselves. So it shouldn't be difficult to organize and uh, create. It will take time. Yes, it's it's difficult. It's a lot of work, but we can uh, we can drive our own innovation starting uh, from our communities. I think that's possible. And we see that happening, you know, all over all over the African continent. And uh, we should be able to follow suit. You are on mute, Nathanael. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, really. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of questions, I guess. Uh, but thank you, really. It was, uh, yeah. It was, uh, uh, I think our time is also, I think it's, it's now, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, it's better to stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, really. I hope we will. Uh, See you again maybe next semester uh, sure. on, on our topic. And maybe by, by, by that time, we will call you Dr. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. all. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear from all of you, but uh, hopefully next time, as you said, not nice. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. OK, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.